Hello, um, and a very warm welcome to Chamber's Church. My name's Amy, um, and I'll be leading the service this evening, and it is really lovely to have you here with us. Whether you've been around for a while, um, maybe you're a regular part of our church family, or maybe you've come along for the first time tonight, visiting or just looking into Christian things, um, we're really glad that you're here, um, and really do hope that you feel very much at home. We hope too that you'll be able to stay around at the end of the service for a cup of tea or coffee. It'll just be served in here um, in this main room um, and that we'll all be able to enjoy the chance that time together gives us to get to know each other and to encourage each other as well. So if you're able to, please do stick around for that later on. In our evening services across this term, we've been looking at the book of 2 Timothy and we'll finish that tonight as Robin, who is one of our ministers, preaches from the final part of the book later on in the service. Last week, we heard these words from Paul to Timothy at the beginning of chapter four. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. With that charge for God's word to be faithfully preached, ringing in our ears, we'll begin this evening with a song which is really a prayer. A prayer that the Lord Jesus, the one who these verses show us will be judge over all in the end, would be the very focus of our lives. So as the band lead us, let's stand and sing together. Oh 
Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you and praise you so much for the grace that you've shown us in Jesus and for the inheritance that we have in him now and always, as we've just sung. We know how quick we are to forget or take him for granted. And we pray that you'd please forgive us for that and help us to fix our eyes more and more on him and on the glorious future that will come to his people. Knowing what lies ahead, we ask that you would help us to be people who gladly and faithfully serve you now, even when doing so is costly. Help us to keep going together in what your word tells us to do, and to keep going until the end. Thinking on all that we've been learning from 2 Timothy about your word, that you speak to us through it, that it's good and wonderfully powerful. Thank you so much for the time that we have together this evening to listen to you and to learn from you through it. Please help us to be attentive and to be humble, and please work through it to grow us for our good and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll hand over now to Robin for a few notices. Thank you very much, uh, Amy, and uh, welcome tonight. Let me run through different things happening in church life. Firstly, this is Easter week. And uh, this Thursday, we have our first special Easter service, which is a Monday Thursday service at uh, 7 o'clock, and there'll be communion at that service. And then Good Friday on uh, 7 o'clock on uh, Easter Friday, and then Easter Sunday morning, uh, kids' programme at 9.30 as normal, and 11.30, and Easter Sunday evening, where we'll look at the question, does God care about the planet? All of these services, we really want and pray them to be guest services, so do consider who you might invite along uh, uh, to them. And if there are flyers that look like that up at the back of the church, please take them and uh, uh, consider who you might ask. Now, if you would like to listen to the sermon in your own language, you can do this using the Microsoft Translator app. For more instructions, there's a guide that can be found on the information board in the foyer or via the QR code on the service sheet. And each week, a code will appear on the screen before the sermon, so you can listen uh, along. And this is the last chance to sign up for the Mark Drama that will take place in June. Uh, the Mark Drama is a great way for people to hear the Gospel of Mark in a really engaging way, and hopefully then consider the Gospel for themselves. Uh, Cast members would need to be available for all rehearsals and performances. And if you would like to be in the cast, please contact Naomi in the church office by five o'clock uh, tomorrow. There's a church walk coming up. Uh, the next walk is in the Botanic Gardens, meeting at the East Gate at 11, walking across the gardens and back uh, again. There'll also be time for cake and coffee at one of the cafes, or you can bring along a packed lunch. Please sign up by contacting the church office or by speaking to Wendy Don. And then finally, uh, after the service tonight, up in room seven, uh, those of us who are able will meet to pray for uh, two of our gospel partners. I said it would be one this morning. There's one family, but also another one now. People going through very complex and difficult circumstances. We can't say what they are, who they are up front, but it would be really good if, just informally, some of us can meet together to pray for them uh, upstairs. If you would like to know and don't know, uh, please speak to me or uh, any of the elders, and we'll be glad to update you on what's happening. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. But Sheila is going to come and lead us in our prayers for others in a few moments. Um, but just before that, we're going to sing again. Our next song helps us to reflect on the deep peace that believers can have, knowing that we've been saved for eternity through the gospel. And in the last verse, it focuses our attention on the day of Jesus' return, helping us to look towards it gladly, knowing the hope that is ours in and through that day. So let's sing together as the band leaders. Thank you. 
Let us come to the Lord in prayer. As we come near to God, we remember the words in Philippians 4. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding 
will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Lord, we come to you tonight asking for that peace that can only come from you to be with us and those we pray for. We bring to you, Lord, the ongoing war between Gaza and Israel. Father, the situation grows more and more desperate day by day. And for so many people, they are living in circumstances we can hardly imagine getting any worse, and yet they do. Lord, we cry to you to intervene and somehow bring this war to an end. We pray for the hostages on both sides to be released, for humanitarian aid to reach everyone in desperate need, and for those negotiating a ceasefire to succeed in some form. Father, the pictures we see on our TVs are horrific, and hearing from children who have lost their whole family, begging us for help and an end to it all, we cry to you for wisdom for those in negotiations, and that they will have compassion for those suffering. We thank you for aid agencies, and for those trying to set up a new hospital to administer medical help to hundreds, enable aid to reach those most in need, and we pray for all Christians on both sides to show Christ's love and humility. We pray, Father, for our deacons who cover the areas of treasurer, IT, pastoral ministry, health and safety, and global mission. We thank you for each of them, their care and diligence in the areas they serve in. And we ask, Lord, that our deacons would follow what 1 Timothy 3 says. Deacons must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to too much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. Lord, we ask that as they serve, they would know your help and guidance and would show Christ to others in all they do and say. Lord, we lift J and R and their family in East Asia. We pray, Father, that after several months in Australia, with much greater freedom for children to play and make friends, that you really help them as they settle back into life in East Asia with many restrictions in being a Christian and also a foreigner. We thank you, Lord, that their time in Australia allowed them to consider that if the current model of theological education to local pastors is unsustainable, relying on foreign faculty members, what alternative approaches are there? We praise God that ideas are already forming and plans are taking shape to launch something different. We pray with them over the coming months as they take initial steps to establish a program for ministry which focuses on biblical competence, a big task daunting both J and R to begin something new. Praise God the children were able to slot into a local school, but pray on for what they should do in the future, as schooling remains uncertain. Pray too for R, as she has considerable travel over the next few weeks around the country, and pray for J, as he too travels east to consider future plans there. Father, we ask you to uphold this family in all the busyness of these days, Give them time together in your word and family time of fun as they faithfully serve you in challenging situations. Finally, we bring to our royal family as they face yet another challenge this year with the diagnosis that Catherine has cancer. We ask, Lord, that as they face this new challenge together and help and support one another, that they would seek you and your strength and help. We thank you for Catherine's boldness in speaking out about her cancer and in recognising that hundreds of families face this news daily. And that includes our own dear C of MNC, also in East Asia, who underwent surgery last weekend. We pray, Father, for all families with cancer, that Christians would come alongside those who do not know you, and that they would share with those who do just your love and your peace and your help in these very challenging days. Lord, we thank you for hearing our prayers 
In the precious name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Sheila. Well, as we sing it again now, we'll think again about that final day, the confidence that believers can have in light of it, and also the mindset that helps us to faithfully walk with and serve the Lord until it comes. After that, we'll read from God's word. Catherine will come and do that for us, and then Robin will preach. But first, let's stand and sing together. reading this evening comes from 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4, reading from verses 6 to 22. This can be found on page 996 of the Church Bibles. 2 Timothy chapter 4, reading from verse 6. <clears throat> For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Do your best to come to me soon, for Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. 
Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, also the books and above all the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first defence, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Prisha and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus remained at Corinth, and I left Trophimus, who was ill, at Miletus. Do your best to come before winter. Eubulus sends greetings to you, as do Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brothers. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Catherine, and to Amy, and to Sheila, and our musicians uh, for uh, leading us. Now, tonight we conclude our uh, studies of 2 Timothy. Uh, this is the last letter Paul wrote before his death. And tonight we look at the last words of the last letter, chapter 4, verses 6 to 22. Paul's words are, are poignant, they're moving. They're inspiring, emotional, challenging, realistic, beautiful, all of these things and more. And remember that the apostles' words are Jesus' words, written under the inspiration of God, breathed out by God. So let's be quiet for a moment, and I'll lead us in prayer. Loving God, thank you for this letter. Thank you for everything we, you've been saying to us over the past few months from it. Help us to listen and to do what your word says. And as we come this evening to the end of the letter, the last words of the Apostle Paul's last letter, help me to say what it says in the way it says it for the reason you gave us it. For our confidence is that is how the Holy Spirit will supernaturally empower the preaching of your word to change us. And will you help me to apply it, connecting with our lives, engaging our hearts for the transformation your word intends? Will you help us all to listen, to listen for your voice, expecting you to speak, ready and willing to be who you have called us and enabled us to be, and to do what you have called and enabled us to do? And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the first heading on the service sheet, a letter written for the whole church. Just look with me at how Paul begins and ends the letter. Glance back to chapter 1 and verse 1. Chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will for the sake of the promise of life in Christ. To Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace. The letter is addressed to Timothy, a leader in the church in Ephesus. And now turn to the very end of the letter. Chapter 4 and verse 22. Chapter 4 and verse 22. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you all. The your, your spirit is plural, and you all is evidently plural. 
How do we make sense of this? Is the letter written to Timothy as a leader in the church or to everyone in the church? The text of the letter tells us it is both. It is a letter about leadership in a local church written to a leader, but also written to the whole church. So they are all aware of the responsibilities of those in leadership, what they need to hold them accountable to, and how to support and pray for them. What is meant by leaders in a local church? Local churches are led by elders, whether set apart and working full time, like Timothy, or serving alongside other work or indeed in retirement. That means this letter is directly relevant not just to Rod J and me as full-time elders, who are given the responsibility for the bulk of the preaching, but all 16 of the elders that I will now name. Alan and Willie and Norman and Bruce, Callum, Craig, Derek, Graham, Chris, David, Joe, Andy and Ian. It's important to name them. As those in leadership in Chalmers, all of us are directly in focus. What Paul says to Timothy is relevant to us all. And that is what you need to hold us accountable to. This is what you need to pray for us. And these are the things you should look for in a leader. But we have sought in this series to define Christian leadership more broadly to all those involved in leadership in a local church, small group leaders or youth and children's leaders, and those in church to aspire to leadership, people, for example, who will become elders in the future, and people being trained for vocational ministry through the Ministry Associate Church Leader and Women in Ministry training programs. Now, we noted what is a key verse in the middle of the letter, Chapter 2 and verse 2, what you have heard from me, Timothy, in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men. The word is people, it's a generic word, who will be able to teach others also. And so, it is a letter about leadership in a local church addressed to leaders, elders and others, future leaders, people being trained for leadership, but written to the whole church. All of us need to understand what the Bible teaches about Christian leadership, so as to know what to look for in a leader, a vital factor in choosing a church, as many of us will have to do in the future, to hold them accountable to and to support them through prayer and in other ways. Now, just two points tonight, Paul's testimony and then what I've called partnership in adversity. Firstly, Paul's testimony, verses 6 to 8. Let's read these Wonderful verses again. Paul says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time for my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. And henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Now, Paul has just uh, chapter 4, verse 5, exhorted Timothy to complete or accomplish his ministry. And Timothy's inspiration and ours is Paul, who has completed and accomplished his ministry. Now, it's important to emphasize first that Paul's life is a testimony to God's grace. It is not a testimony, his life or ministry, to Paul's gifts, character, or accomplishments. All one needs to do is to read the story of Paul's life before he was converted and how he was the recipient of the extraordinary grace and kindness of God. The source of all that Paul was able to be and do is Jesus. It is Jesus who converted him, who changed him, who equipped him, who enabled him to persevere and endure and who kept him. Jesus is the source of of Paul's strength. And Jesus is the source and foundation of every true and faithful Christian leader. It is only because Jesus lives in us by his spirit that any leader is able to fight the good fight to run the race and to keep the faith. It is only by grace. Now we've learned that in Genesis profoundly so. There are numerous references to that in a letter like chapter 2 and verse 1. 
a repeated refrain, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 6, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Paul is conscious that he will very shortly be put to death because of his Christian convictions. And he speaks of his death as a sacrifice, as a drink offering. So imminent does he believe his death to be that he speaks of his death as having already begun. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. A sacrificial death at the end of a sacrificial life. The time of my departure has come. Now the word Paul uses to describe his death, the word translated departure, was a word commonly used to describe a ship being untied or loosed from its moorings. The language Paul uses creates a powerful and emotive picture. In his commentary on 2 Timothy, John Stock puts it like this. In Paul's life, the anchor is weighed, the ropes are slipped, and the boat is about to set sail for another shore. And with the imminence of his death in his mind, Paul looks back and reflects on his ministry. It is not boasting. It is simply factual and fair, an honest assessment of his ministry. It is not boasting. It is simply factual and fair, because Paul knows it is all due to God's grace, God's mercy, and the power of the Spirit in the apostle's life. So how does Paul reflect on his ministry? Well, in these three short phrases, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now in these phrases, a description of what faithful ministry is like, an inspiration to Timothy, to us, a description and inspiration to every Christian indeed. And let's consider each in turn. I have fought the good fight. Now, when Paul says these things towards the end of the letter, he is uh, drawing on uh, comments or lines of argument already in the letter. Back in chapter 2, Paul paints a portrait of the Christian leader. The first brush stroke in the portrait, chapter 2 and verse 3, share in suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. The Christian leader is to be a soldier, a fighter. That is the first brush stroke that goes on the canvas. And it is the first thing Paul says as he looks back on his life. I have fought the good fight. What is the nature of the battle? The battle is for truth or more precisely, to hold on to the truth. That is the battle Paul is talking about in 2 Timothy. And all around Paul, and it seems all around Timothy in the church in Ephesus, and indeed all around the church in the Western world today, people are departing from the truth. They are departing, swerving from, lurching from, or moving away from step by step, what Paul refers to the pattern of the sound words or the sound teaching, chapter 1 and verse 13. The apostolic truth. Every generation of Christian leader is called to stand for truth. And to do so in normal times, one needs to be a soldier, a fighter. The Christian soldier is engaged in spiritual warfare whenever they preach or teach the Bible or speak the gospel. Why is that? For they are preaching or teaching or speaking the gospel into a world of lies, a world that is the domain of the devil, the prince of this world, the father of lies. In uh, his letter to the Ephesians, the same church is here. Paul reminds them and us that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and authorities the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. The soldier fights with weapons, 
the Christian soldier's offensive weapons are prayer and the ministry of the word. And therefore, it is no surprise that the summit, the charge at the end of the letter, chapter 4, verses 1 to 2, is to preach the word, to let loose the offensive weapon in this warfare with lies, to vanquish lies for truth. But remember that Paul's picture of a Christian leader as a soldier at the beginning of chapter 2 is part of the same picture of a Christian leader as the Lord's servant at the end of chapter 2. The warrior and the servant. The fighter and the gracious, patient, humble person. And so that's what it takes to fight the good fight. To be a warrior and a servant. Who supremely is that like? The Lord Jesus, the servant king. Now, what must every soldier be prepared for? I want to suffer. And a soldier's suffering is a certain kind of suffering. It is suffering for the sake or for the benefit of others. A soldier lays down their life for the sake of others. The Lord Jesus laid down his life for the sake of others. The apostles laid down their life for the sake of others. The Christian leader in many parts of the world literally will lay down their life for the sake of others. The Christian leader, elders, small group leaders in churches, not just metaphorically, but in sacrifice, in servant-heartedness, lays down their life for the sake of others. That fight for truth is a fight that people will live and believe the truth and go on living and believing the truth. Suffering for the Christian leader is a note sounded again and again through the letter. Let me just point you to what is a very consistent theme. Just helpful that we see this. It's not an emphasis that we would bring to the letter. It is right there and plain to see. So chapter 1, verse 8. Do not be ashamed, but share in suffering. Chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. So, reference one, why will you suffer? You will suffer if you stand up for Jesus in some way or other. Second reference that we saw, 111 to 12, why will you suffer? You will suffer because you are a preacher or a teacher of the gospel, not ashamed. Chapter 2, verse 3, share in suffering as a soldier of Christ. Chapter 2, verses 8 to 9, remember Jesus, for which his gospel and for him I am suffering. Chapter 2, 11 to 13. Chapter 2, 24b. Chapter 3, verses 10 to 13. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. And Paul's summary statement in chapter 4, verse 5, As for you, Timothy, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, accomplish your ministry. As a soldier, the Christian leader, the Christian needs to be willing to suffer for the sake of others. It is not exceptional, it is inevitable, it is normal. Suffering takes many forms. In some parts of the world, it is direct hostility. In other parts of the world, it is antagonism, rejection, the discouragement of apathy and indifference. In this church, for some of our leaders who are here tonight and who are not in the first flush of youth, for them, it was year after year after year of standing for truth in a very difficult situation and at a difficult time. That is what Christian leadership is. That is why this church exists. That is why we are in this building. And so, and we'll come to this in a moment, that's why we need to keep running running. 
most of all, I think, suffering for all of us is simply living constantly day in, day out in the realm of spiritual warfare. Uh, here's a great quote. I don't know who said it, but I nicked it anyway. It's like living in a safari park where the lions are always on the loose. <laughs> or like swimming with sharks. Paul says, I have fought the fight. Second, I have finished the race. Uh, and the, the, the kind of allusion into that second metaphor means that you haven't fought the good fight until you've finished the race. Or you haven't fought the good fight unless you keep on running the race. And once again, Paul is picking up a theme from earlier in the letter. The second brush stroke in the portrait of the Christian worker in chapter 2 is of the athlete who does not receive the victor's crown unless they complete according to the rules. And by that, Paul means running a straight race, not cutting the corners, not changing the gospel we proclaim or the Christian life we live. And it's not a sprint, it's more of a marathon. It's not a sprint on, uh, I'm going to use a number of sporting illustrations that might be lost in the vast majority of us. Here's an obscure sport, cycling. Okay, cycling is not obscure, but the sport is. It's not like cycling in a velodrome. It's more like the Tour de France, climbing up Arc de Relentless, relentless, relentless climbing with the hostile crowds all around you. Yesterday, I was able to watch Messrs. Michael, Tom and Hamish playing hockey for Edinburgh University. Jack, Tom's brother, none of them are here tonight, uh, so I can talk about them. Don't tell them I said that. Jack was playing for Watsons on the other team. All four played really well. Edinburgh won 5-0 and sit second in National 1, Scotland's top hockey division. Now, in the first half of the game, Edinburgh went 4-0 up quite quickly. But then, uh, and Hamish afterwards was giving me the lowdown, uh, Watson's got back in the game a combination of change tactics to contain the Edinburgh team and determination. And it was visible to the spectator, or spectator, really, there were a few of us. It was rather cold. There was a definite change of gear, an edge to Watson's play in the second half. And what impressed me most, though, was how the young students, and many were young, upped their game, worked really hard, kept pressing right to the end of the game, even though they were 4 0 up, and they were awarded with an excellently worked goal in the last quarter. Running the race means running to the end of the race. That's just logical, isn't it? Listen to these words of the Apostle Paul at the beginning of his ministry. This is from Acts uh, 20. But I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Paul has fulfilled his purpose, and he can look back and say, I have finished the race. Uh, Eric Little, um, uh, who's uh, pictured as a runner on the stained glass of the church just next to the Eric Little Center, famous for his Christian faith and testimony, when asked for the secret of his success in the 24 Olympics when he won gold, he said this, and as he always did, he spoke metaphorically of his spiritual life. Let me read it. When the starter's gun goes, I run flat out. On the back's crate, I tough it out, pushing hard. The final bend is when the fatigue hits you, but the prospect of the finishing line gets you round. Then the final straight head down, running hard for the line. Approaching the line, you neither look left nor right, but keep focused till you break the tape. Only then is the race run, only then is the race done. Are you running the race? Are you keeping on running? Run the race for Jesus, strengthened by his grace. And remember that Christianity or churches, or leadership is a team race. We do not run alone. Some of you will have watched the Kenyan athlete, Elliot Kipchoge, run the first marathon under two hours. He was only able to achieve that in human feet because he ran as a formation as part of a team. Now, sporting illustration's nearly done. Here's the one that you need to remember tonight. The London Marathon, competitor number 8296, 
finishing time five hours, 29 minutes, three and a half hours behind the winner. That runner is just a number, anonymous, in the eyes of the world, will never make the sports pages. And yet the medal worn with the same pride as an Olympic gold medal. And the commitment, the training, the dedication, the achievement of that runner, just as great as the Kenyan Elliot Kipchoge. That is perhaps a better illustration of what running the Christian life is like. Now, we run at different paces as we get older. It might be that all we can do is watch others running. Had I uh, requested to be substituted onto the hockey pitch yesterday, I, I just couldn't have lasted for more than two minutes because I'm getting older. It's not wrong to cheer people on from the side, encouraging the next generation. But in some way, shape, or form, we keep running. Paul is passing the baton to Timothy, but he is cheering him on. Now, my application, my uh, exhortation to myself and to Roger and to Jay and all of us as elders is keep running the race. Keep running the race. Pass leadership on. Cheer them on, support and encourage them. Never stop. Never stop running or walking until your time is done. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. Now Paul picks up many strands here in the letter. You can reread the letter and see them guarding the gospel. That wonderful triptych, the gospel was entrusted to me, Paul says, it's entrusted to you, Timothy, you entrusted to others. Entrusted, entrusted, entrusted. He kept the faith. He passed it on. He held on to what he was taught as a child about the scriptures. He passed that on. He held out the word. Chapter 4, verses 1 to 2, he preached. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. What will you get when you get there, when you get home to glory to be with God? A crown of righteousness. And what Paul means by that, I think, is that all the spiritual blessings that we receive at conversion, including the glorious future inheritance that we are guaranteed the moment we are converted, all of that will be fully and finally ours on the day we receive the crown of righteousness. Is it just Paul, the great apostle, who will receive this crown of righteousness? Paul makes it clear that every single Christian that has laid up for them a crown of righteousness, not only to me, he says, but to all who have loved his appearing. Now these are great verses, 6 to 8. Now in the last little bit of our time, let me say a bit about the closing verses 9 to the end. They remind us how real all of this is. They root Christian leadership in the context of gospel partnership. They root Christian leadership in the corporate. One of the things that we have learned as a church is that leadership is corporate. One can say that but not actually do it. It is corporate leadership. We are becoming a corporate leadership here in Chalmers. The generation that are being trained for leadership need to have that corporate dimension through and through in their sinews, their minds, their hearts, their consciences. For without that, they will not survive. Paul is a real man with real tears, with real struggles and real needs. If I was to sum up 9 to 22, it would be partnership and adversity. Verse 9, do your best to come to me soon. That's Timothy. I wonder if Paul really thought that would... <laughs> well, the time for my departure has now come. I am being poured out like a drink offering. My life has been loosed from its bearings and the ship is sailing to another place. What's well, just human? Do your best to come to me soon. Let me see you as the last person I see. For Demas, in love with the present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. You can sense the hurt in what Paul says about Demas, who, like Philegius and Hermogenes in chapter 1, once stood shoulder to shoulder with the Apostle Paul. 
Chalmers is not a small church. New people come all the time. But if, as elders in the church, we do not grieve and pray for and feel the pain of those people who turn away from the gospel and who leave, we must do that. Verse 14, Alexander the metal worker, you can read of him in the Acts of the Apostles, had given Paul a really tough time and uh, Paul warns Timothy about him. Paul's sense of loneliness is in part because of those who deserted him, but it's also because he is separated from his companions. Verse 10, Cretans has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia, Luke alone is with me. Tychicus has been sent to Ephesus, probably with this letter for Timothy. And then verse 11, Luke alone is with me. Get Mark, and of course, Paul and Mark had fallen out, but they're reconciled, for he was very useful to me in my ministry. Tychicus I've sent to Ephesus. When you come, Timothy, bring the cloak that I left with carpets at Troas, also the books, and above all the parchments. If he's still alive by winter time, he wants his cloak because he's cold. And he wants his scrolls and his parchments, almost certainly, because he wants uh, the Old Testament scriptures uh, written out in his kind of own personal Bible. And then verse 16, at my first offense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. There are times in the Christian life, in leadership or indeed for us all in the Christian life, where God allows us to be utterly alone, no one standing by us, so that we become acutely conscious at verse 17 but the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And Paul's final words, verse 19, greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Anisiphorus. Earlier on, he said that Anisiphorus refreshed him. Verse 20, Erastus remained at Corinth and I have left Trophimus who was ill at Miletus. Do your best to come before winter. Eubulus sends greetings to do, as do Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brothers. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Now in conclusion, what about you? And all I want to do as we conclude is draw your attention and mine to that repeated refrain throughout the letter, exhorting Timothy to stand firm. Let me show you. Chapter 1, verse 15. Timothy, you are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. And Paul's point to Timothy then, Timothy, you know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me. They are not prepared to keep that pattern of sound teaching. They are ashamed of the gospel of me and my suffering. You know that, Timothy. And you know that included in those who deserted me are these people, Timothy, that you know. These two that you and I both know well. They deserted me, Timothy. And there are times in the letter that Paul persuades Timothy with logic, with the gospel, and rightly so. But there are times when he just appeals to him as a brother in the Lord. So don't you, my son in the faith, desert me. Paul makes that same point again a few verses later. Chapter 2 and verse 1. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ. Timothy Always stand fast in God's grace. Chapter 3, verse 10. In contrast to the false teachers Paul described in 3, 1 to 9, 1 to 9 Paul says, You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfast, my persecutions and my sufferings. Timothy, you know my teaching. You've seen it. You know how I live. You've seen how God has given me grace to persevere, to endure. So don't be taken in by another 
form of teaching or life. And then chapter 3, verse 14, all around you, Timothy, people are drifting from the Word of God, drifting from that strong heritage. Verse 14, but as for you, and chapter 4, verse 1, I charge you. And then chapter 4, verse 5, as for you, always be sober-minded. Keep your head. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Accomplished your ministry. It is a striking pattern through the letter. You are aware, you know Timothy. You then, my child, be strengthened by grace. You, however, but as for you, I charge you, as for you, so what about you? What about you? What about me? When the time of our departure has come, will we be able to say, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. We can't make it to the end alone. We get there with others, with gospel partnership. And we can't make it without God. So grace has the last word. Grace be with you. Let's pray. Our Father, we pray that our studies in this letter will have done us good as we learn and understand what true Christian leadership is. Help us, those of us who are in leadership, to depend on your grace to be fit leaders. We pray that Chalmers will be a church with many, many people in leadership, for gospel partnership is a rich and powerful thing. We pray for those training here to be church leaders and gospel workers in the future. We pray that this letter will steady them, will galvanize them, will convict them and assure them that all that you ask us to do, you give us the grace to do it. Help us not to be frightened, but help us to be real, realistic, to have the eyes of faith. Thank you, Lord, for those in this church family who have put their neck on the line and stood for truth in very difficult circumstances. Thank you for the inheritance that we receive from them. Help them to keep going. Help all of us to keep running the race and to keep the faith. Help us to run the back straight hard. Help us to keep on in the final bend. And help us to run down the finishing straight, looking neither to the left nor to the right, until we break the tape and look up when the race is run and the race is done and the crown of righteousness is placed upon our heads. And thank you that we do not run alone. And thank you most of all that your grace is with us, ahead of us, behind us, in and through us, for all that we do. May Chalmers be a church full of leaders like this. And may we send them out into the churches of this land and beyond and when we go to choose other churches, as many of us will, we pray that we would choose wisely, choose well, and be leaders in these churches that are faithful and true. And lastly, Lord, we pray for people on our hearts who, like Timothy, are faithful leaders. We'll pray for some of them later tonight, who are faithful leaders who, like Timothy, are normal and are struggling and not sure if they can keep going. We pray that through our gospel partnership, through our prayers, and through your grace supremely, they will keep on running, keep on walking, keep on standing. Grant to them encouragements in the race and strengthen their hand. For we pray all these things in Jesus' name.
and for his sake. Amen. have a seat. 
Now it's uh, 7.42. Let's, uh, we'll pray um, 10 to. Let's uh, give a chance to, to grab um, a coffee if you would like to do that upstairs in room uh, 7. So let me pray as we close. Lord Jesus, uh, we thank you for these wonderful words that we've sung at the end of this Sunday. Thank you for Sundays, for the blessing and the richness and the means of grace that they are. Help us, Lord, to make good of our time to have conversations and then to speak to you in prayer for our weary brothers and sisters. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.